All right, everybody. We, we think we've, we've finally connected some audio here and video. Hopefully, we'll make this smooth for you in the future. Um, we appreciate everybody that's chiming in. Um, so uh, while, we, while we're here and while we're waiting, Broder, to get connected, um, I see a few of you have already commented. One of the things that, yeah, and Broder, that's perfect. You're framed perfectly. Um, so uh, one of the things that's nice about this system, now that we've got it connected, is we can see some of the comments on screen. So uh, I see Gary Birch chimed in that uh, Joan and Gary are watching. Uh, Gary and Joan were our sponsors for this week. Um, and so we really appreciate them and their support for Historic Athens. Uh, Milton Leathers has chimed in saying, what is this episode going to be about? Uh, this is an opportunity for us while we're living through history, uh, specifically with the coronavirus here in Athens, Georgia, to record for posterity what that moment is like. And so we're going to be checking in with 55 different community leaders. Uh, Broderick is one of those community leaders. We're very excited to talk to him and we'll uh, introduce him and his credentials here in a moment. Um, and then Cindy Carp. Uh, uh, Cindy, hello. The multi-talented Cindy Carp's trying to watch. Uh, hopefully we've got you connected now. Um, and so uh, if you're watching and uh, as we're going through, if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to drop them in the comment section below um, and I'll be able to throw them up on screen and we can kind of go through them and address them. Uh, so with that said, thanks uh, to all of you that are tuned in. Thanks for your patience. Um, Broderick. Um, yes. So uh I really appreciate you working with me to get here on the line with us. Uh, some of the people tuning in don't know that it's kind of a tradition of ours that when we kick off a new venture that one or the other of us be our first guest. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate you being the first guest to this program. Um, you know, it's hard when I was putting out the caption this morning to say you'd be our guest, I had to try to summarize you in just a few characters. And I know that's really hard to do uh, because you do so many things, but if someone's tuning in who um, hasn't met you before, doesn't know your work, or if somebody's referring back to this 50, 60 years from now, um, who's Broderick Flanagan and, and, and what does he do? Oh, man, that's a, that's a tough question. Uh, I'm still examining that myself. Like, who am I and what do I do? Um, I just say I'm like a, a, a huge community advocate and community connector. Um, you know, I, I wear many hats in the community, but uh, most of all, I just consider myself um, a servant to people in, in need, um, or not even necessarily in need, but just people that um, that need to be connected, whether it be to resources or to opportunities and or, um, you know, organizations and institutions that can uh, help address, you know, their, their situation. Uh, so I see myself as just a big connector in, in many facets. Okay. Um you know, we're trying to capture for pos posterity in this kind of audio visual time capsule, what it's like to live in Athens in this moment. And I think we have to go big before we go small. So um, let's start by doing that this way. So before this all started, Broderick, uh, what was a week or a month like in your life? What, what, how was your work unfolding at this time in Athens? Um. Wow, I, I, I need to really think about that for a second. Um, Cause like this whole crisis mode that we're in kind of has to us into like this warp zone almost. Mm -hmm. uh, so thinking back, you know, I was going to a lot of like community meetings uh, talking about things like, you know, how do we help people in poverty or how do we uh, create and programs and initiatives to address people uh, with barriers to economic, um, you know, stabilization and uh, sustainability. And, uh, you know, going to meetings with organizations like East Athens Development Corporation, um, you know, just joined the board of United Way of Northeast Georgia, uh, been in conversation and communication with uh, some of the mayor and commission, uh, meeting with different, you know, nonprofit groups or uh, community groups to find ways to address uh, systemic problems in our community. Uh, so that was, you know, largely a lot of the work I was doing, um, but then also juggling life as an entrepreneur, as a visual artist, um, trying to wait, trying to, you know, find ways to maintain my artistic practice um, from doing murals to creating, um, you know, writing grants and whatnot, submitting to different opportunities, 
uh, local and, you know, abroad. And, um, you know, just uh, trying to balance those different things, those different aspects of life, and then have some resemblance of a social life or family life. Um, so, so yeah, just uh, doing those things on a regular basis is what, was, was what my week to week kind of looked like, and, you know, so I would go mm -hmm. to my studio and, and find time to paint and work on paintings and uh, reflect on ideas even and reflect on community work or uh, the impact or lack thereof of uh, some of the things that I want to see happen in the community for people living in poverty or, you know, the working class people uh, yeah. of that. Um, tell, can you tell us more about Flanagan's Portrait Studio and the work that you do at the Portrait Studio? Uh, yeah, sure. I can share a little bit about that. So, um, you know, I opened up my art studio back in 2014 officially when I opened up the brick and mortar space. And initially, uh, you know, I just had some, you know, wavering ideas on what that could potentially look like, um, you know, as an as an artist who was mostly self-taught, um, just trying to navigate that space in that world. So I was connecting to a lot of different organizations working in the arts community. And uh, over the years, I learned so much from different organizations, uh, serving on different board of directors and uh, just staying plugged in in that space. Uh, so those things I learned, I was able to take that and uh, translate it into my studio practice, which included, um, you know, weekly art classes for kids in the underserved area where my studio is lo located. Um, you know, that ended up developing into a more robust program uh, that serves like teenagers. I found like there were gaps in certain age groups even um, in which uh, service organizations were providing um, opportunities for, for certain youth. And um, so I started uh, working with teenagers and showing them how to do murals and created a program around mural making, like public art, um, showing the, the students from start to finish what the process looks like from uh, designing the mural uh, to um, execution of the mural and completion of that. Um, and they got to be a part of the majority of that work in those different facets of like what it takes start to finish to create a public art project. And uh, mm -hmm. even I in, added into that an opportunity for you to get paid a stipend uh, for helping me out because it was important for me as an entrepreneur to show people that there's value um, in their work and, you know, to start to set those uh, principles and, and, and goals for uh, young students to be aware of and to work towards, you know, being valued. So, um Kay Nichols Everett just chimed in to ask you, uh, can you tell us where some of your work is located? I know that's hard to narrow down, but if somebody, especially now that we're social distancing, but some folks are out walking or exploring the city in responsible ways, um, where are some of the places that people can see your work? And then when things reopen, where can they go to see your work? Um, yeah, I have a couple of pieces on, on display at the Jury Art Show and the Linden House Art Museum. Um, but there's also several murals around town. Um, those include one at the Melting Point or the Graduate, um, the Foundry area, hotel area near the pool. There's one on the side of Food for the Soul on Broad Street, uh, a mural there I did with uh, uh, several different community groups, um, including some police officers uh, from UGA, the Sheriff's Office, um, and our local uh, police department. and. Uh, there's a mural downtown that I was able to work on with an uh, artist out of uh, Miami, Ilio Mercado. Um, that was a great experience. I learned a lot from him. Um, and then there's also a new mural that I'm working on over on the east side where my studio is located off of Vine Street. Um, there's actually three murals over there in that vicinity, in that same area uh, that I was able to work on or, or to, to lead. Uh, so there's a mural of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King that I did back in 2016 uh, with some youth and uh, community partners. And then in this past year, I was able to add two more murals to that same space. Uh, Mr. Ellison was allow allowed us to paint uh, on some of the property that he owns over there. Uh, so if you go through Vine, the Vine Street, Peter Street, Glesson Street area, uh, you'll see at least three murals um, right in that area where my studio is located. And um, I, I'm not like open right now, but I still go to my studio from time to time. Um, you know, you know, doing work, uh, you know, in a mo mostly administrative capacity. 
Uh, but I have had a couple of people drop in to see some artwork uh, recently. Um, of course, we were observing like social distancing practices, but um, I had a few, few people pop in here and there. Great. So, uh, uh, Kay, thank you so much. Uh, and Broderick, you should know, Kay just uh, added an additional comment that I'm going to put on the screen for everyone else, which is she said, oh, wow, I've seen your work and didn't realize. Uh, you are amazing, exclamation point. Um, uh, so, all right, Broderick, uh, I, I want to ask one last question before we move on to the moment at hand, which is just, uh, it, it's again, kind of moving out to this idea of, in you know so our organization historic athens our job is to celebrate and conserve community heritage here in athens and uh it's hard not to think about folks reviewing this transcript or this video or this audio years from now and uh and so is there anything else you have to say just kind of about this moment in athens i mean you know you know the day before this all started before we all started having to shelter in place when you thought about Athens in that moment. Uh, is there any, anything else you want to add about uh, who we are right now? Um, yeah, I guess I can touch on that a little bit. I think we're a community, um, a vibrant community that was experiencing or beginning to experience some, some growing pains in certain ways, at least from my vantage point, it felt like that. Um, you had new people taking a leadership role in leadership positions. Um, you had new ideas being brought to the fore. Um, you had some resistance to some of those ideas. You know, people were dialoguing, though. And I, I feel like, um, you know, like we, we were starting to kind of like, I guess, work towards uh, common goals in some respects. Um, and, and from my understanding, which I hope we can kind of get into a little bit deeper, um, as we go through this conversation, uh, but really kind of beginning to look at, um, you know, policy and, and how that shapes the landscape um, and, and what policy can be put in place, uh, what policy that's allowable for us to be able to move people, uh, more people that are experiencing poverty, um, even prior to the pandemic era, you know, how we can get those people in a more stable position. Um, you know, I, I think that there was a lot of movement and, and conversation around that, uh, which I believe will continue. Uh, but I think that Athens was going through those type of growing pains. Great. So Broderick, we've had some really good questions come in while, uh, while you were speaking. And I, I think one of them is a great way to kind of transition into talking about this moment in Athens history. Um, and so I'm going to come back to Francis's question in just a moment. Um, but I want to bring up Gary's question here. So this is Gary Birch. Um, so, you know, Broderick, I know that anyone who knows you knows that you have a lot of humility and it uh, it's rare that you'll describe yourself as a leader, even though so many other people describe you that way. Um, and, you know, you're, you're a community leader, you're a leader in your neighborhood, uh, you're a leader in the area. Um, tell us about what it's felt like trying to accomplish leadership work uh, during this crisis? Um, uh, that's a great question. I, I appreciate that question. Um, and I can only speak for myself. You know, there are several organizations that I'm connected with. So I, de I just definitely want to make sure I put that out there. That I'm not necessarily speaking for any organization that I'm currently affiliated with um, or otherwise. Uh, these are just my, you know, my opinions and my observations from my vantage point. Uh, but with that being said, you know, I feel like, um, you know, there are so many uh, ways that I try to serve in the community. And some of those ways are, I guess, accepted better than others. And it's been tricky to navigate and uh, a constant learning point for me as I began to identify points of connection or points of power within institutions and trying to address those in a way that's uh, that's going to make space for the greater good for our community, right? Uh, that looks different for different people, you know. So I appreciate the space that's been created for people like me. Um, and I guess if I can allude to that a little bit, like so, I know a lot of people are aware of IRME, I'll say friend prone, 
you know, he has a lot of charged ideas and he, he sparks a lot of intentional conversation, I believe. But one of the things that he does, at least for me, that I've observed is that he creates space for me to go into certain conversations um, because people don't necessarily, or I, I've noticed that certain people don't want to necessarily deal with him uh, because of his bluntness. Uh, it allows uh, someone like me to go in who has similar goals, I feel like in some respects, you know, everything that Army says, I don't totally agree with, but I understand where he's coming from. And uh, we have similar goals about uplift about people in poverty, especially black people experiencing poverty in Athens and how we've been neglected in some cases and left out of certain conversations. Uh, so I believe that creates a space for me in some instances to be able to do a certain type of work. Um, and th that's also frustrating at the same time, though, and, and it makes me a little bit anxious because I want to make sure that I am also doing work that's going to lead to people becoming economically stable. Um, and right now, one of those main things that he speaks about a lot is like jobs, creating jobs and job security, jobs at great wages or good wages, uh, livable wages. Uh, that's an issue that we deal with in this community. There are a lot of people, there's a low unemployment rate, but there are a lot of people that are working that are not taking home enough income to be um, economically uh, sustainable or viable. Uh, so in trying to do that specific type of work and to, to make sure that I'm adhering to, to those type of goals, is important to me, but often frustrating because when I go into some of these community conversations and start talking about that, uh, you know, it's very rare that I've seen personally that people take a people first approach in those conversations. It's always putting the institutional stakeholders uh, in front of the actual workers or employees. And that is, it, it, it's been something that's been kind of frustrating to me in some regards. Um, so without, you know, kind of going on and on about that, that that's kind of been my experience as a leader as of late, um, or, you know, as, you know, as it pertains to some of the work that I've been trying to accomplish and, and look into, it's been, yeah. you know, it's, it's been a journey, a, a learning experience, um, as well as, like I said, identifying those, those points of connection and, and power within institutions. Great. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, just bring onto the screen a comment from Deborah Gonzalez. Deborah is actually our guest tomorrow. Um, we're really looking forward to speaking to Deborah. Um, but Deborah just said, enjoying this conversation. Thanks, uh, Tommy and Broderick. And so, uh, Deborah, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, you know, Broderick, you're talking about some of the work that you do. And so one of our uh, comments here comes from Francis Oliver. Uh, Francis is one of our interns here with Historic Athens. But community member in her own right. And I know that she had the chance to recently take uh, one of first, one of the first of hopefully many of the hot corner tours that you're putting together this year. Um, and, you know, her question was, you know, have you, have you given any thought into whether this will continue in some form virtually? Are you planning on bringing it back once shelter in place is pulled back? Um, and then also, do you have any information? Have you heard any news about what the future might be this year for the Hot Corner Festival, uh, given the current situation? Um, yes, thank you for that question. I remember her from the, uh, I think she took one of the tours, um, potentially, maybe. Um, but yes, uh, I do want to continue with the tours. I've kind of put them on hold, the Hot Corner Historic Tours. I've kind of put them on hold for now because, um, you know, I recently stepped into a new position as a neighborhood coordinator or neighborhood leader through the uh, prosperity package work. And that work has become primary uh, as of late, especially now because of the crisis mode that we're in. So connecting people to resources, identifying barriers to economic uh, sustainability and, and stability for families uh, has been pressing and part of my day to day throughout this process. And um, so, so yes, I kind of put those type of projects and things on the back burner uh, for now because families are in great need right now. So like those other things that are important to me, uh, but not as important as the, the people, you know, that need uh, connecting. So yes, I do. Uh, I have thought about creating a virtual platform potentially to continue the tours and whatnot. Uh, it's been on my mind, um, but yes, definitely after this uh, period, um, that we're in kind of goes away. I do want to continue working with um, 
those different stakeholders for the hot corner uh, historic tours. And um, what was the last part of that question? Uh, she just wanted to know if you happen to know anything about the future of oh, yeah. uh, the hot corner festival. Yeah. Right, right. So I haven't uh, spoken to Mr. Homer Wilson specifically about that or anybody on the hot corner uh, committee. Um, I, I presume that it may be postponed, uh, if anything. I feel like this is a historic year coming up for the Hot Corner Festival, its 20th anniversary. Um, and for those that aren't familiar with the Hot Corner uh, Festival that are listening, um, the Hot Corner Festival was a celebration born about 20, 20 years ago exactly um, to celebrate the historic African American business district um, that was in downtown Athens and still is to a degree in downtown Athens the historic hot corner district um, that has several business professionals um, and businesses that serve the African-American community's needs um, under Jim Crow segregation, uh, the zero seg segregation. And, um, you know, and beyond that time period, you know, hot corner has been uh, a staple in the African-American community. And so there are a few people that came together to commemorate that and to make sure they preserve that legacy. And uh, the Hot Corner Festival was the, the iteration of that that happens every second Saturday in June. And uh, a lot of people are very appreciative of that because it celebrates the spirit of the entrepreneurism um, by allowing vendors, um, you know, different types of vendors, African-American and other, to come out and, and sell their wares and be part of this big celebration with music, uh, food, dancing, uh, celebration, you know, gospel performances, like all types of things. And it's, it's a beautiful thing to witness and see. Um, so I, I presume that it will uh, continue, uh, but it may be postponed, uh, but, you know, okay. definitely reach out to Mr. Homer Wilson to, to get, uh, the specifics yeah. about those details. Very good. Thank, thank you, Broderick. Yeah. All right. So I'm, I want to go to one last, uh, user submitted question. And, um, I, I'll just say, uh, in doing that, uh, Helene just, added a comment to say, so glad to be with both of you this afternoon. Helene, we're glad that you're here too. We hope that you'll continue to tune in. We're going to be doing a broadcast like this uh, every weekday from one uh, at one o'clock until uh, June 26, 55 different community conversations. And we're so thrilled that Broderick Flanagan was able to help be our first one here. Um, so our last user submitted question just for the moment. Um, and then I have a few specific questions I wanted to dig into. But so my apologies to Gary. Gary earlier asked a question about the Neighborhood Leaders Program. He asked about your role as Neighborhood Leader. I just know Broderick and assumed you meant as a Neighborhood Leader, but there is the, the very specific Neighborhood Leaders Program. So Gary wanted to just follow up and say, you know, uh, working with Tim Johnson, Terrace Thompson, and others in the Neighbors uh, Leaders Program, uh, you know, have you worked with them throughout this crisis? Can you share some specifics? Um, what's going on with the Neighborhood uh, Leaders Program right now? Um, yeah, yeah. So again, uh, I may not be able to speak to like specific details and whatnot, um, uh, just for, for people like families I come in contact with, you know, their privacy and whatnot. Um, and, and again, I don't speak for the organization or anybody like that. I'm just speaking to my personal experience, but sure. working with Tim Johnson, working with, uh, Ms. Terrace Thomas, Thomas, uh, has been a delight. Uh, it's been great so far. Um, I've, like I said, I learned a lot been able to come into contact with a lot of families that I may not have come in contact with before outside of this position and and really kind of bring to light some of the uh, systemic issues that we have in this community and to the degree that people are experiencing uh, economic uncertainty um, that's only been amplified and exacerbated by what's going on right now with the crisis. Uh, so being able to connect people to different resources in the community has been vital. Um, looking forward to conversations, though, that go beyond just resource connection to like food distribution and, you know, uh, the basic necessities and household items that people need during these times um, and the economic relief uh, through the stimulus and, and other various uh, mechanisms. Um, looking forward to conversations, like I said, about policy that moves us beyond this space that we're in of, uh, you know, of this uh, the, the, the disaster and, and what that brings, you know, the, the urgency that that brings. Um, you know, there are a lot of families that are struggling, uh, a lot of people on the front lines doing great work. Um, and it just needs to, in my mind, we need to plan also while we're doing the work, the immediate, meeting people's immediate needs. 
um, just continuing to think about like how we rebound this from this in the future um, with those families, those vulnerable families in mind. Um, I'm yeah. also seeing a lot of barriers to barriers to participation, uh, especially in the immigrant community. Um, you know, all these relief efforts that you think about from unemployment, all these safety nets that we have, like food stamps. Um, a lot of those families aren't uh, privy to uh, because of their uh, status um, or lack of uh, citizenship. And, um, you know, it's really bringing to light, you know, those people that are here, um, for whatever reason they're here for, they are here, they're in our community, um, and they have children just like anybody else has children, and they, they work. Um, and, you know, now that they're not having those uh, points of connection or employment, um, it's important that we find ways to work around policy that prevents them from participating in those relief efforts. Uh, that's been very important to me, um, especially. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, all right. I, uh, I, I, I want to just add here. So uh, Dan Delamater posted uh, nice work, friends. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, I see a lot of people starting to tune in here. So we appreciate you joining us. Um, if you are just joining us, uh, this is uh, a special new series called This Moment in History, COVID-19 in Athens, Georgia. Uh, Historic Athens, which is a local 501c3 nonprofit, we've operated for 52 years. We work to celebrate and conserve community heritage here in Athens, Georgia. And uh, we're going to be talking a little later in the program about how you might get plugged into our organization if you'd like to. But in this moment, we really just felt required to try to celebrate and conserve the living history, the public history that's happening around us. We're gonna be conducting 55 interviews with different individuals that represent different parts of our community, a whole cross section of our community. Uh, we're doing so with the support of our sponsors who we'll be thanking a little later. But this week, each week we have a different weekly sponsor um, and that is Gary and Joan Birch. Um, and so yeah, you can tune in uh, every weekday until June 26 at 1 p.m. We'll be back here having these conversations. Um, and so uh, with that said, I want to go to just kind of a general question. And Broderick, I think you already started getting to the heart of it, but uh, with so many people social distancing, especially those of us that have the privilege of being able to social distance or or have jobs where we're not, where we're not being forced to come in, um, uh, it can be easy to feel alone. It can be easy to be vulnerable. It can be easy not to know what to do. Um, but it also can be easy to feel disconnected from other people's suffering. And so I know that you were talking about the way that this crisis is affecting the most vulnerable people in our community. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, when history looks back at this moment, what what should the future generations of Athens know about the way that this, um, this impacted your neighborhood, your friends, uh, you know, our communities? How how has this impacted Athens in general? Um, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> honestly, there's a lot that I don't know. Uh, I have a limited, a, a very limited view of vantage point of what's going, like what's really going on. Yes, I see a lot because I'm out in the community and I come in contact with families. Um, and, I, and I try not to speak too much into the generalizations, you know. Uh, because different people are experiencing different things, you know, even, uh, you know, I was thinking before the call, I was like, there are people that have money, actually, essentially, that are solid, solidly and securely in the middle class that are experiencing things that um, uncertainty, economic uncertainty, because they're unable to work or one of their spouses may have lost their job and, you know, they needed both incomes to make things function month to month. Um, you know, so, you know, I, just thinking about like, I guess the anxiety that sometimes that may bring on for certain people, um, but relating that to those vulnerable populations you just spoke about, um, those people have been living under that duress for much longer periods of time. Um, and, and it's just like, you know, having the ability to make sure you, you pay a, a 30 or $40 water bill becomes brings about that type of anxiety for some families and some people um, for much longer than this COVID crisis has been happening. Uh, so 
I see a lot of that, um, you know, and, and it's only being, I guess, like I said, amplified because of what's going on in social distancing and, and people, um, you know, trying to make sure that their, um, you know, benefits continue, whether it be unemployment or uh, whether it be, um, you know, food stamps. Um, people have been definitely grateful to be able to apply for some of those type of services. Um, but again, those social safety nets aren't available for everybody. Um, you know, so experience or, or seeing families experience uh, that type of uncertainty and even potentially engaging in like more risky behaviors to try to make money um, to make sure that their bills are taken care of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been, you know, very daunting and it, it takes a toll on you as a person too, um, as a human being, like seeing that and experiencing that even if you yourself aren't going through it. You kind of feel a level of, of empathy or sympathy for these families that are experiencing that, and you want to do something to help. Um, you want to, you know, try to connect them, like I said, to resources. And in some cases, those resources are limited. But then we have a very caring community here in Athens. Um, I've even heard that people have been taking their uh, stimulus money, those that are getting stimulus uh, checks that may not necessarily be in a financial hardship. They've been donated to donating those to organizations and people that are doing uh, relief efforts. Um, I think that's very commendable. But then what do we do uh, beyond that uh, to make sure people don't need to, to, to depend on other people's charity and, and coming from that vantage point? You know, it's not that I'm saying charity is a bad thing, but it's like to, to, to put people's livelihoods at the whim of other people's charity and excess is not an adequate uh, solution to people's, uh, you know, economic situation. Uh, that's 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 just as whimsical or uncertain as you know a lot of the things that are happening right now to many families. Um, so again, I just you know go back to the whole policy conversation. I'm looking forward to those uh, larger, deeper um, workforce development, economic development uh, conversations that put people first and that. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that are able to approach uh, our business community and our institutional community uh, with, with those things in mind, saying that, hey, you know, we, we recognize that you have a business or institution to run uh, and, and you're about the bottom line, but your, your labor force is very vital to that process. So if you're not right. taking care of your labor force, um, who is helping your institution run or operate, as you see now from these essential workers uh, that many institutions are seeing how important people are and labor is, um, then how do we take care of those people uh, moving beyond this crisis? What policy can we put in place? Um, and how can we encourage uh, institutions, private and otherwise, to uh, take that people first approach? You know, um, there's several conversations going on around town about ways we can do that, um, you know, from a worker center. Um, you know, to help people organize and advocate for uh, benefits in, in certain spaces. Um, you know, unions in the state of Georgia uh, are very limited in what they can and can't do, uh, that, but that doesn't mean that they can't happen, you know. Uh, so, I mean, it's, there's a lot of conversation I'm looking forward to having, you know, beyond this space and time. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll throw out... We, we, the, our users here are really submitting some great questions. And Broderick, we also want to be sensitive to your time, even though we know part of it was uh, be, you know, used to get this connected. But we want to use our time with you as best we can. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to some... Okay, good. Um, so uh, I guess one quick question, and then I'll go to some user-submitted questions. So uh, when social distancing is over and shelter-in-place is over... Um, what are going to be some of the first local businesses you go out to support? And what are some local businesses that you think, uh, that you really hope survive this crisis? Is there anything that comes to mind? Um, yeah, there are several that come to mind. Um, you know, there are several businesses that I already support on a regular basis or were supporting before COVID that I look forward to continuing supporting, um, including like Kelly's, um, Dog on Good Barbecue. Um, you know, Rashid's Cuisine, uh, Manawinta on the east side. I love the Ethiopian and Eritrean uh, dishes that she prepares, like the lentils. Uh, man, it's so, it's so tasty. Um, you know, it's, yeah, really. And uh, little 
ice cream do, you know, for him to be able to re realize that dream of opening a brick and mortar space, you know? Right. Um, and, and then to have, uh, you know, something like this uh, threaten the viability of, of his uh, business and his dreams, you know, is I definitely want to go and try to support them. Um, I mean, there are several, there are a lot of different, um, you know, businesses that I really enjoy in, in Athens and, uh, you know, just love their uh, community minded uh, entrepreneurship that they operate within. Um, but yeah, those are just a, to name a few yeah. some organizations and, and businesses that I look forward to supporting um, after the crisis. I um. Is there anything you can't get right now that you really miss? Like for me, it's, I, I, of course, our local entrepreneurs, I want to spend money in as soon as I possibly can. A lot of them are offering curbside. And so I'm trying to order whenever I can, but I just miss, I just want an all-star special from the Waffle House. That's all I want right now. Like, is there anything like, is there anything like that right now that you just, you wish you could get your hands on? Um, no, nah, not, not really, not in the moment. Um, Nah, man, I, I, I keep it very simple, man. Like, I, I okay. I'm really missing right now. I don't think, you know, I have to think about that for a moment. Maybe before the end of the call, I can, I'll think of something. Um, I, I, I'm going to throw up a comment here from uh, Deborah Gonzalez, which she just urged us to remember that we can support local businesses by picking up uh, gift certificates. She said she's already picked up three from a little ice cream dude. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Broderick and I agree on a lot. One of the unfortunate differences between us is he went to Clark Central and I went to Cedar Shoals. I'm very proud that little ice cream dudes at Cedar Shoals right now. So we got to support our Jaguars. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, CCSD in general, we're good with. Um, uh, Broderick, a couple questions that have popped up on the screen. One is from Milton Leathers, um, longtime supporter of Historic Athens, really great local historian. But um, something we actually never addressed on this call, which is, we keep talking about your neighborhood, but we haven't identified what your neighborhood is. So can you talk a little bit about what what you consider home? Yeah, right now, uh, there's the Chase Street school zone. Uh, but, you know, I've lived all over Athens, though. Um, you know, District 2, um, out on Danesville Road, um, you know, when I was growing up, I bounced around from public housing to public housing. But right now I'm in the Chase Street uh, area. Uh, so doing a lot of work in Rolling Ridge and Broad Acres and um, different communities like that. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great question. But I still do work also in East Athens. My studio is still located in District 2. Uh, so I'm still doing work over there in the community garden, um, yeah. doing murals over there and things of that nature. Uh, so yeah. Great. Um, I, I have more serious things to do, but Jeremy Field in our comment section jumped in to say, fire it up, CC. Um, I'm going to think of Clark Central. I don't know your, your gladiators uh, catchphrases. I know, um, go Glads. Go Glads. Go, go um, all right. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, I think this year's Cedar Central game is going to be the biggest one in years and years and years, just because everybody's going to want to get out and see everyone. Um, okay. Alex Sams uh, just jumped in uh, to say, uh, as a you know, Broderick is a longtime mentor in the Clark County Mentor Program. Um, are you finding creative new ways to stay involved with your mentee or have you, you know, uh, what's going on with the mentorship program right now? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, my, my mentee and I, um, we continue to communicate, but he's no longer in the CCSD uh, school system. So we've uh, kind of aged out of that um, Clark County mentorship program uh, space, but I continue to uh, stay in contact with him. He's at Kennesaw State right now. Uh, definitely Great. proud of him for kind of like following through and applying and getting accepted and whatnot. Uh, there was a time when he wasn't sure whether he wanted to kind of even go to school or whether he wanted to study in school. Um, but yeah, we've been able to remain in contact. Um, and then several other mentees that I have, I have, I have several that are within the school district and, and outside of, but officially I'm, I'm not uh, a part of the Clark County Mentor Program uh, any, anymore in that capacity. Um, but mm -hmm. I still mentor several several students, um, you know, outside of that. And um, and yes, I, I check in with them via call or via text sometimes. Um, you know, one recently one of my mentees has came out to help me on the mural that I was working on in East Athens. Uh, again, of course, we were uh, practicing social distancing, so it was just him and I uh, out there mainly. Uh, but 
you know, was able to connect with him uh, in that capacity. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's been uh, many ways I've been able to stay plugged in with my mentees and, you know, just sharing, you know, from the limited experience that I have from the number of years I've been on this earth, um, sharing with them, you know, some things that can help them navigate whatever path they're on, you know. Um, great. So, so, yeah, it's been, it's been great to stay connected with them. Excellent. A um, couple of quick things. So um, Victoria chimed in to say that she loved the use of Facebook Live for this project. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I know you mentioned Rashi uh, Broderick. Uh, I just want to point out Rashi is actually one of our upcoming guests. Um, and so we're, we're looking forward to publishing the full list of our guests. We've already booked about 25 of the total 55. Uh, this week, if you tune in, uh, you can expect tomorrow to hear from Deborah Gonzalez. On uh, Wednesday, you, you'll hear from Dan Geller of Kindercore. On Thursday, you'll hear from Janet Geddes of Avid Bookshop. Um, and on Friday, you'll hear from Commissioner Russell Edwards, who's been really on the forefront of, of trying to provide local protections for this. Um, and so we look forward to having those conversations. Um, Broderick, one question that uh, you know I know you mentioned some folks may be getting additional financial support that they're looking to invest locally. Some folks might come out of this like a coiled spring, just wanting to volunteer and get it, get involved, um, uh, both in this moment and beyond. So Francis Oliver chimed back in to say, how can we, the public, how can we help in supporting your efforts? So what are some ways that people who are listening to you now can can help out? Um, this, this is interesting because I was having a conversation about that uh, recently, um, just about even reflecting on my own work. Um, and one of the things that I was very... Um, you know, intentional about doing the work over the years was trying to focus on ways to uh, enact change on a broader level, like a more systemic level. Uh, so uh, bringing up policy a lot. Uh, I'm, you know, okay at looking at policy, um, but I could use some help in crafting policy. Um, I was working with Michael Stomster at one point in time, and we were looking at housing policy, right? And he mm. was able to work with the planning commission when they were looking at infill housing. Um, they created an ordinance around that. So I was hopeful uh, through that work to create some type of policy that would offer some protections for African-American neighborhoods that were experiencing gentrification at a rapid rate. And, you know, so it's certain things like that that I could use some expertise in um, in looking at ways to, you know, craft policy um, that would be able to do things of that nature, um, not only for just the housing um, in certain neighborhoods, but then also looking at anti-poverty, um, you know, policy and programs, um, you know, help people helping me research um, what's going on in other communities, uh, ways that things are allowable in Georgia that we can start to address some of these issues uh, from a policy and programmatic uh, standpoint. Um, those are ways that I need uh, a lot of help in uh, because it's not really one of my strong points to do research and to, to look at policy or even to craft the right policy. But I understand that the pen is much mightier than the sword, you know. Um, so I, I'm i constantly thinking about ways um, to craft policy, um, even, if, if, even if it's something just, uh, just small, like a bunch of small policies that uh, look at anti-poverty initiatives can, can do wonders over time, more than I can do yeah. as, as an individual, you know. Uh, policy lives beyond, you know, people and, and the work that I can do individually. Um, so that's one thing that I kind of want to continue to focus on and be intentional about. It's like, how can this work inform new policy that helps uh, create a more of a, a broader systemic change, uh, a change sure. that people talk about a lot, uh, but, uh, you know, from, from some people's actions is... It begs the question, do they, are they really serious about bringing about that type of change? Um, sure. Yeah. But so, I, I, yeah, that's great. So we have two last questions today. Um, and we want to, again, thank you for your time. Um, I do want to uh, just very briefly, uh, let's do this real quick. All right. So just very briefly, I brought up on the screen the list of uh, the sponsors for Historic Athens. Um, I want to make sure we just take a brief moment to say thank you to everyone you see on the screen. These are the folks that help keep Historic Athens running. 
Also, if you're chiming into this, please know we are a 501c3. We're a nonprofit like every other nonprofit you know. Uh, that means that in order to continue our work, which includes uh, the work like you see here, public history work, education and advocacy work, um, our public brown bags, our annual preservation awards, Porch Fest, Mardi Gras Masquerade, our annual gala, um, a lot of the advocacy we're doing to try to make sure that we're preserving all of Athens and telling the full story of Athens. Um, we also run Hands on Athens, which does direct home repairs for low to moderate income individuals who live in historic homes. Uh, and we uh, operate the Athens Welcome Center. Uh, if you believe in what we're doing and you believe that local history is important, uh, you can go to historicathens.com and you can become a member. Uh, members have different benefits at different rates, but you can spend as little as $35 a year if you're a student, 55 if you're an individual, or if you just are someone who can only afford a little bit at a time, there's an option where you can just do as little as $5 a month. Uh, but it really helps sustain us. You can also become a sponsor. Once again, all that information is at historicathens.com. Uh, or you can contact me, uh, Tommy, at historicathens.com. Once again, we want to thank all our sponsors here. And so I appreciate uh, Broderick standing by while we did that. Um, so, uh, Broderick, <clears throat> two last questions, one user submitted and then one of my own. Uh, so you were talking about public policy. Uh, you know, th this may not be a coronavirus specific situation, although I'm sure that it only makes it harder. Uh, but you were talking about policy. Uh, Jeremy Field, your fellow gladiator here, uh, he asked, you know, in your opinion, uh, and I'll just put this up on the screen. Uh, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges with affordable housing that you're seeing out there in Athens? Um, I'm, I'm seeing a, a lot of challenges in terms of like development, uh, I, I guess, um, from some conversations I've witnessed and have been a part of is, uh, you know, funding to create affordable housing stock. Um, you know, and, and I guess to even reference that and put it in a little bit more context and maybe I'm, I'm a little off in, you know, my uh, perception of, of what went down recently. Uh, there was a, a developer that brought a proposal to the mayor commission and it was a great proposal. I feel like it's going to create some more affordable housing stock, um, you know, but then they were granting certain variances uh, to allow them to um circumvent i guess creating uh, storefronts on the lower level as well as like a, a park or green space um so you know i, I hear the mayor commission uh, several different members of the mayor commission talking all the time about you know not being able to charge impact fees or uh use uh laws like or ordinances like inclusionary zoning because of certain state laws in georgia um but I mean, at the same time, I feel like there's also opportunities to have conversations with developers, um, even friendly developers like the one that is creating affordable housing off of Highway 29 of like saying, well, if we're going to grant this variance for you, um, that may or may not save you a few hundred thousand dollars on this project, um, increasing your profit margins or whatever, um, you know, is there a way you can opt into supporting this affordable housing fund that we have over here? Um, that way we can continue to build up an affordable housing fund. Um, as I remember, the Columbia Brookside project was largely funded and redeveloped because um, there was monies coming in from the federal level that the housing authority was pouring into a housing fund um, so that we can create affordable housing stock. Um, you know, so, and, and again, like I said, maybe I'm kind of looking at the, the picture or putting it into the wrong context. So if I am, I apologize, but uh, that's just some of the things that I've noticed that we always talk about how we don't have funding to create more affordable housing. Um, but then when there are opportunities that come about um, to try to get developers um, who come to us needing cer certain uh, amendments in policy or uh, changes in zoning or, or things of that nature um, yeah. to simply ask, you know, can, can you support us in this way if we... Um, and, and it may not be uh, in, in the legal parameter for them to do it in that way, but I'm sure we can craft something that allows them to get to do that. Um, you know, so I, I would love to, you know, have more conversations of that nature. But that's one of the things that I'm noticing that's happening um, in the affordable housing conversations that I've, you know, some of the ones that I've been able to be a part of. It's like, 
it's, it's not cost effective for developers to develop that type of housing because the profit margins are so minimal and we don't have as a local government or institution funding to create our own affordable housing stock um, and the federal uh, level is not giving us enough to uh, create uh, enough that meets the demand that we have here locally. Uh, so those are some yep. of the main issues I'm seeing in that realm of affordable housing. Uh, and policy-wise, like I said, like the things that I've looked at over the years, um, just a lot of things that prevents us from doing, um, you know, inclusionary zoning or certain types of inclusionary zoning, like neighborhoods. Um, under-resourced or low-income neighborhoods, like increasing property taxes on because of certain type of development, you know. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's a lot, a lot to think about and look into. But thanks for that question. I hope I answered it. Yeah, thanks, Broderick. All right. So my last question is: uh, typically, at times of economic recessions, uh, that's one of the times that historic sites are most vulnerable. So we're going to come out of this. People are going to want to see jobs come back. People are going to want to see the economy grow. And sometimes that can lead to unrestricted development. It can lead to uh, historic places being torn down that people thought were always safe. And so one of the things that I'm going to be asking each guest here uh, for, for this interview in the next 54 are just really what are some of your favorite historic sites in Athens? What are, what are the, you know, I mean, once again, when we think about this interview being played 50, 60 years from now, what are what are the historic assets and sites in this community you value the most right now in 2020? Um, man, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, I value definitely, um, you know, Morton in, in that area, in the hot corner area. I mean, I value uh, some of the old schools, um, like the, the Reed Street School area, the, um, the, the school, uh, over there by uh, Chestnut uh, Church, I think it's Chestnut Grove, maybe Baptist mm -hmm. Church. Uh, but they have like an old uh, schoolhouse or one house school room that they have there that's been pretty well preserved. Um, and, you know, just the the Bernie Harris campus, uh, the old Bernie Harris campus, now the HT Atwood building, um, you know, it's not as historic anymore. But, um, um, grateful that they repurposed that because that is important as well. They have a heritage room over there that has a lot of history about the, the African-American high school, Bernie Harris High School. Uh, so those are some of the, the sites and places that I hold near and dear. Um, I mean, I also recently just discovered the uh, Welcome Center in athens Clark mm -hmm. County. And, and I took a trip over there and talked to the new, um, is she the new director now? Or she's the interim the director, yeah, Michelle, yeah. Yeah, so the new interim director over there. And um, it was interesting to see, though, just being in that space and to to know about the rich history, African-American history uh, or Athens history um, of the African-American community um, and to not see it as prominently displayed there mm. um, yeah. was kind of, you know, yeah, it, it was definitely eye-opening in some regards. I haven't had time to kind of really address it and sit down with it um, and reflect on ways to uh, work with um, her in that capacity to bring some more of our history because they have like um, these big flyers on the porch area when you walk up to the Welcome Center that has yeah. the Athens historical sites and all these historical people. And I'm yeah. looking at all these names and I'm looking at all these places and I saw maybe of all the five different flyers they have on that porch area they may they only mention i think Ida may hiram uh the first mm. african-american uh, accredited dentist uh, woman black woman dentist accredited in the state of georgia and they name like maybe two african-american sites uh one was uh, maybe the morton theater and i can't remember the other um so of, of all those lists of names and everything you know they only mention uh just a, a, a very few amount of African-American spaces. Uh, so I thought that was very, very interesting, you know, for us to have a welcome center in the, in the year 2020, uh, 2019, um, I think it was when I first visited maybe, but uh, just to see the lack of presence of that part of our history, of Athens history, you know, it, it, it said something to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, from that, from that, yeah. I, I think that's, 
a troubling thing to see, but we're glad that you saw it. And, you know, we look forward to working with you to get that right. So, um, Broderick, I want to close by just giving you the floor. Is there anything else that you want to share both with viewers now and viewers later? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, just uh, like I said, was talking about earlier and like uh, examining our role and how things playing out are playing out. Um, you know, during this crisis mode, uh, being diligent and resourceful and connecting uh, people to resources like, you know, the Athens Mutual Aid Network or EADC or the Athens Area Community Foundation. And they're giving um, that they're trying to bolster right now for community relief. Um, United Way of Northeast Georgia, there are several organizations working to uh, gather resources and disperse resources in ways. Um, but making sure that those resources get to community organizations that are um, on the ground doing grassroots work. Um, you know, the ARC is doing great work, but they have their limitations, um, so as, as do many organizations. Uh, so just making sure we equi equitably uh, disperse those funds to a, a number of organizations that touch different parts of our community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being very diligent in the planning process on what economic development looks like and workforce development looks like in the future. Uh, recognizing now that how these times have shown us how important workers and labor laborers are, you know, from the people cleaning the floors um, to the people that are at the bedside with patients and the people serving us uh, in the different stores that we are able to go to to get food to the people that even source the food to get it to the store. Yeah. Um, you know, so making sure that we keep those people in mind as we're crafting policy and thinking about economic development and thinking about the vulnerability of, that these times have created for people um, to make sure that those people are taken care of, whether it be through wages, um, whether it be through expanding, you know, healthcare for all or, and whatever other things that people can dream up, but just making sure we put those people uh, first. Great. Um, yeah. Great. Broder, thank can't thank, thank you enough. Thank you for the of, opportunity, of, man. Of, of course. I, I'll mention just for those of you that are tuning in, Tim Johnson just popped up and uh, in the comment section, you can find a link for um, information for each neighborhood leader by zone. Um, Broderick, uh, you know, if someone's watching this audio, or watching this video or reviewing this via transcript years from now, you know, the main thing that th on behalf of Historic Athens, we want to say is that, uh, you know, you're exactly the kind of person and your work is exactly the kind of work that makes this community something worth preserving and conserving. Um, I imagine, you know, uh, 50 years from now, someone will have my job and it'll be their job to protect your murals all over this uh, community. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have this time to spend with you today. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, please keep up the good work and we'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. See you Bye. later. Yeah.